This is Jordan Edwards, and this is the Business Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. Good afternoon, Matt Cully. Hey, Jordan. How are you? Very, very good. Uh, honored to have you on the podcast. Long time coming. And I would consider, I think that this is my, my second um, special episode. I'll tell you why. My, sec- my first special episode was, was when I hadn't hosted my dad. And I'm going to say this is my second special episode because uh, of what you've meant to me in my life and also being one of the owners of our academy, Budokan. But to frame this conversation, I just wanted to tell a quick story before I introduce you fully. And that is that if you're lucky enough to have somebody or a group of people in your life who uh, have your back, truly have your back, then, then you are blessed. And I, I have been blessed by our friendship over uh, 13 years and counting. For, it'll be 14 years in August. And that's because I have been an imp- like almost everybody who's ever done jujitsu or anything in life. I've had an imperfect run at jujitsu. I've had times where I've been on the mat, off the mat. Um, I've basically been on the mat since my purple belt. And I think the only reason I have my purple belt is because you got me through my blue belt blues all those years ago. And there was three distinct times where I went MIA and I hadn't been on the mat in a couple months and you called me up and got me back on the mat. All you did was just say, Hey, if you want to come train, you know, I'll, we can just roll or we can meet up. And the first and second time that that happened, you know, you, you, I was young. I was in my, my late twenties. I didn't really understand the ego, but I understand now very fully what I was dealing with. And that was the feeling of, uh, shame, the feeling of regret, the feeling of being scared, scared to go back to jujitsu and not be as good as I was getting beat by people I could have beaten before. And so, uh, I'm going to stop rambling and just say that I'm very, very, very grateful for you. And I use you very often as a uh, shining star of, of what it means to be there for somebody. And to you, maybe at the time, you, it was just, that was just who you are. You know, you just did that. Um, but it, it speaks volumes about you and your character. And I just wanted to tell you I'm very, very grateful. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I, I, I do remember that back then. And um, I'm glad it all worked out. And uh, here you are. Uh, a skilled brown belt these days. <laughs> yes, trying to. So let me introduce who you are. Matt is a, a really um, special entrepreneur. He has done a lot. You have been in many businesses but from the time that you were a young man starting bars. But today, you are the founder and promoter behind Rise Invitational, which is a premier uh, grappling organization in New York, uh, headquartered here on Long Island. You've had the best of the best jujitsu names uh, compete on your stage, and you're growing that business Um, in the face of COVID and all the challenges of operating a a fight sports business in New York, of which there are many. You are a fight manager to the likes of UFC star Randy Brown, one of our teammates, and also Tanisha Tennant, former Invicta uh, women's champion. What, 135 pounds, right? Yes, bantamweight. Uh, Bantamweight. And you've also been a content creator with partnerships in your own podcast with Everlast and across the whole world of mixed martial arts. In the New York area, you're a fixture, and uh, it's really, really great to have you on the podcast. Well, I appreciate that. That, uh, that makes it sound like I've been doing some, some good things over the years. It sounds better <laughs> coming from you. Well, I'll, I'll be your hype man. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Uh, so I am from Long Island, um, Valley Stream, Malvern area. Uh, I grew up in, back and forth between uh, Valley Stream and Malvern. Um, I went to Chaminade High School uh, here on Long Island as well. And uh, like you mentioned, I, I started my uh, entrepreneurial journey early in my uh, in my 20s, about 21. I, I covered a shift here in Valley Stream um, for a friend just uh, covering the door at a, a local bar, uh, bouncing basically. Um, and uh for whatever reason they invited me back the next week and kept inviting me back and i kind of uh worked my way up in that business uh from the door to kind of hitting every job um from uh 
bouncer to to barback to bartender to manager to you know, profit sharing and then eventually um i set a goal for myself to own um a piece of a, the business by the time i was 25. so when i was about 24 and a half or so i ended up buying half the business and becoming co-owner and that kind of started my my love of of, of being an entrepreneur and the the freedom it, it brought to my life and you know at the same time i was also working my way into the IATSE local one uh, state change union. So I was doing both. I was working days in the city, um, nights at the bar. Uh, I was young, so I didn't sleep much. Um, <laughs> I wasn't partying like my friends. I was just working a lot and going back and forth. Um, but that bug never left me. Um, I eventually became lighting director at, at Channel 13 for uh, a Lincoln Center studio. So I was doing that while maintaining um, the bar business. I opened my second bar in 2008, unfortunately, right before the, the, uh, the downturn of the entire economy. Global recession. Yes. Yes. So, um, that was a, a, a big dilemma in my, my young entrepreneurial uh, journey. And it also was a time where it led me, I'm sorry, let me just lower this. It led me to realized I wanted to spend my time as a business owner um, involved in uh, businesses that added something to people's lives that, that, that brought some good to their lives. And the best thing that came out of the um, economic downturn, and however you want to look at it, the, the failure of the, the second bar, and my transition away from being a, a bar owner, um, was that being a big fan of the UFC and MMA at that point, uh, after the Ultimate Fighter season one, I had an interest in finding some kind of martial arts and, and as much as I loved MMA, for some reason, the, the ground game, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu stuck out to me even more so. And every time I would pass um, a Jiu Jitsu school, I would take a picture of the, the number, I'd write it down, but I was so busy. I just, is one of those things where I never thought I would have time to actually do it. And I saw in the newspaper, um, the local, uh, I think it was a Herald, that there was a school opening on Rockway Avenue and Valley Stream and Matt Serra was gonna be there for the grand opening. And that just stuck into my head. Um, I wasn't able to make it there that day, but my friend had gone for a private lesson a few weeks after, and he called me up and he was raving about this teacher, um, this guy named Sensei Nardu, you, you might've heard of him before. And I decided to go with him and, and try private out. And I went and I never left. And I've been there ever since, eventually became co-owner of Budokan and, uh, and here we are. So mate, incredible story. And I, I guess I, I want to know one of the things I always try to unlock in these conversations is like, why, like, what do you think it was about your personality or your growing up family influence that made you feel like I could do that entrepreneur thing? Like I could work for myself. You know, like you had this union job, you were becoming a stage, like, like you were, you were working in the city. A lot of people who get addicted to that salary, you know, and wanting to make money, it's, it becomes almost impossible for them to take that leap. Like, have you ever thought about like why you're different? Um, that's a really good question. And, and, you know, there was a phase in my life after the bars before, while I was just training and I wasn't a co-owner Budokan where. I was very burnt out from the bar business and, and my original partner and mentor in that, in that business had told me as I was buying in that this business can, can burn you out very quickly, especially at your young age. Um, and I hit that wall and I did retreat a little bit at that time to like, I have a great job. I was, I was the main line director, the youngest line director in the history of 13 and it was a good paycheck. And I fell into that hole a little bit at that time. But I would say early on in my life, I, I did get the experience, um, thankfully, uh, through my, my father's businesses that he had at certain times over my uh, childhood in the construction business, where I was um, heading up jobs at a very young age. I was bringing my friends out and heading crews up to, to do construction or, 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 or do certain types of, of, of work for him. Um, when I was going to college uh, for a few semesters, I, I went to night school in order to run a masonry job at the 72nd, uh, 72nd Street subway station in Manhattan uh, for my father. So I was uh, dealing with people and running crews um, well above my age and, and, and kind of leading people that had possibly more experience 
in that field than me, but not in terms of, of the overall managerial skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that initially gave me, I guess, the comfortability to, to operate in that, in that manner and, and run businesses. And then again, the, the early mentorship that I got from um, a guy named Kevin Sheehan, who owns a lot of bars uh, here on Long Island still over the years. Um, I just got that bug from him and it, you know, it just never left me and gave me, eventually gave me the confidence again after transitioning um, to wanna, wanna jump back in and like I said, get that freedom back in my life, but also try to use it in a in more of a positive way not that bars aren't positive um and i don't want to talk down about that industry but in my experience it just wasn't for me i wasn't um, someone who gravitated gravitated towards um that scene other than it was my business mm -hmm. um and falling in love with martial arts i just saw uh, a synergy there that i wanted to yeah to explore I'm going to do a, a quick pause on the conversation and say that your brother-in-law, Mike Conicelli, who's in the FDNY, was a guest on the podcast. And him and I have spent a lot of time together. And last March, we spent a lot of time together going up in the car to Massachusetts to a uh, this amazing training session led by Jocko Willing's organization. And he was telling me stories about his bar ownership days in the city. And all the crazy stories and things that he lived through, and uh, it, it just you know that whole the whole point is the whole bar life is wild. I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like to own a bar. He was telling me these stories, and I said, "You gotta, gotta write these things down. This is a TV show." <laughs> exactly, it's crazy. You know, Manhattan is obviously Manhattan. It's it's yeah. it's uh, its own world. Um, and my unique experience was I, I was a very young running a bar in the town I grew up in. So, you know, I'm 21, 22 years old running this bar in the town I grew up in. You know, my brother's underage friends, my friend's underage younger brothers are trying to get in. You know, it, it's chaos. Um, but it was a great learning experience for, you know, a lot of things seem easier still to me today because mm -hmm. it's not that that full chaos of, of running bars like that back then. Yeah. I don't think I knew that uh, your father was in the construction business and you had that background. Oh, Matt, Matt is a beast of a martial artist. I mean, you not only on size and strength of which you have both, but also on technique, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, you have incredible physical strength. And I've asked you over the years, did you grow up playing sports? Were you like a football star? Were you like some kind of crazy athlete? And you've said to me no over the years. And uh, now I think I understand where it's coming from. You grew up around construction. Yes, and and for many years masonry construction. So yeah. you know, uh, lifting coping stones and, and and buckets of mortar and mixing mortar and things like that. So that and and luckily, you know, just starting weightlifting early in my teens and sticking with it. You know, I think you build a good strong foundation that stays with you. The yeah. earlier you can start. And you grew up playing music, right? You're you were in bands, musician, guitar. Yes. So that's when I kind of transitioned. When I was very young, I was uh, um, all about sports and I was very into basketball and baseball, traditional sports. Um, loved basketball, that was my first love. And um, in my teen years, around 13, 14, um, I fell in love with playing the guitar. And that was, that was my next love up until um, I started working in, in the bar business, actually. I was, I was in a band at that point and I kind of hit that fork in the road and I went to the business side. Yeah. So you, we, to pick back up on our story, you, you walk in, you take your first private in on Rockaway Ave in the very first iteration of Budokan. Sensei had just opened his, his first academy. He had been a professional fighter and coming up through the circuit, he was a ring of combat champion and he was going on, it, the UFC wasn't even, it was, it was relatively big, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't like uh, written in stone that it was going to be the leader in the sport. There were many other promotions of which he was on. Um, it was a very, very young sport, and he was on that early scene. What, were, what are some of your early memories in Budokan, you know, training under Sensei? Um, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is just almost that, uh, that awe of the, the, the technique and, and the – like I said, I did have a, a um, an eye for it and, a, and, a, and an interest in it from watching MMA and seeing how people can all of a sudden set up arm bars and things like that. And even back then, 
jujitsu and MMA is nowhere where it is now, just like jujitsu is nowhere where it is now and the, the level of skill and technique that's out there now. Um, but to feel it done to you, especially when you're a big guy, and I was a much bigger guy back then, you know, uh, towards the end of, of working in the bars, I got up about 270, 275. I was lifting a lot of weights. How tall are you? Um, um, six, six, three, six, four. Yeah. Six, four on a good day still. Now that my, uh, <laughs> all my, uh, my joints and everything is getting compressed. I'm trying to paint the, I'm trying to paint the pictures for the listeners and the people who don't know you, the imposing nature that you are. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was, uh, running a door out in the Hamptons for, for my partner at the time. All those guys were monsters. I knew nothing about actual fighting back then. And you know, the thing was to, to get big and strong. So that, that's what I did. And as I got into MMA, I started seeing these guys. None of these guys were that big. And I, I remember reading a, a workout plan by Rich Franklin back then. And the amount of reps he was doing, he was doing bodybuilder type workouts, but very high repetition and, and, and supersetting and just nonstop, um, nonstop work. And I remember thinking like, if I had to run around the block right now and then defend myself or fight someone or throw someone out of a bar, I don't think I could do it. So I started bringing my weight down and trying to get in shape and doing things, you know, you read magazines or whatever that martial arts are doing. They used to have, you know, UFC fighters on the cover and things like that. But when I went to Budokan for that first private, I still was, was over 240, you know, probably closer to 250. And, you know, if me and my friend were going, it was like, like two bears attacking each other. You know, at one point, I don't know if you remember Sensei has that drill where um, the guy in bottom holds his belt and just uses his legs. And the guy on top puts one hand on his belt. Yes. can use one arm to try and pass. Yeah. So me and my friend Steve, who probably had 20 or 30 pounds on me at the time, um, you know, Sensei probably remembers this if you bring this up to him. We were doing that and it was just a, a bear, bear mulling a bear trying to, you know, use whatever technique we had as, as you know, uh, pri doing a few privates, white belts. Um, but then to get the experience of rolling with Sensei and – the way he could manipulate your weight, the way you couldn't really get to him, no matter how big and strong you are, no matter how, and the, the more muscle you tried to use, the harder it became and the, the, the weaker you became and the stronger he felt and the heavier. And then when he got on top of you, he felt like he was 300 pounds. It just didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I got addicted and, and I just kept going. And, you know, after a few times, my friend kind of trailed off and stopped coming and, you know, I just kept going. And I remember getting a stripe, after doing some privates with sensei on my belt. And that was like, uh, you know, eye opening, like the progression of it. And then one day after a private sensei, you know, I'm getting changed at the front door. You, you remember the old small dojo that we had up front. Mm -hmm. And he said, Hey Matt, have you ever thought about competing? And it was, I was still in that beginner, uh, that initial phase where I was actually renovating and opening my second bar at that point. Mm -hmm. So I was very much, um, uh, I was looking for new challenges still. And that whole competition thing kind of did cross my mind. It almost crossed my mind watching MMA and watching fighters. Like, do I want to do that maybe? And when he said that, I said, yeah, I actually have been thinking about that. And he said, well, there's a competition in three weeks. If you want to do it, I think you should jump in. And I said, what do I have to do? And he said, sign up, start coming to classes so you get more mat time and we'll figure out what weight you should be. So that was great. I signed up. Um, Unfortunately, the weight he wanted me to be was was in the 205 category, and I was still probably 235, 230 at that point. So I spent the next month training a lot and uh, cutting my calories a lot and, you know, going for long walks on lunch in the city at work and all these things. And I got to the 205 and I went to the tournament and um, it was a long day, but it, it was a great day. And, you know, it, it just solidified in my head that, you know, this is what I want to do. I, I was a white belt. I got to watch you turn from being a white belt to a blue belt all the way to being a black belt. And I remember vividly because sensei will still talk about those early competitions and he called it the Uchimata from hell. And you use incredible judo technique to take down what felt like the biggest person I'd ever seen. And you threw this guy clear across the room, right onto his back. And, uh, I just, I have such a vivid memory of those, of those competition days, those early days, like 12 or 13 years ago. And, um, oftentimes when I've fought in competitions over the years, my wife will say, 
what, what weight are you fighting at? I'll say, well, I'm 220 right now, but I'm trying to get down to the 205. I really don't feel like I could fight the 220 division anymore. And she'd be like, why? What's the difference? So I take her to her first competition and in walks a guy who's legitimately seven feet tall, 300 something pounds. And I say, do you see that guy over there? And she's like, that guy? I'm like, yeah, that guy. That's why I had to lose the weight. <laughs> But you were throwing those dudes around. And I just want to say that, like, you were tossing those guys. And I'm almost positive you won that competition uh, with grace. <laughs> yeah, Uchimata was, was one of my go-tos for sure. Uh, initially from Sensei. And then uh, luckily we had that time with Harry St. Ledger as well. And that really added a lot to my And we're going to talk about Sensei in a second. But let's just give Harry a shout out because I do talk to him from time to time on Instagram. Uh, I remember so clearly Sensei saying to me and all of us, you don't know what I'm bringing you. You see these guys, Harry and Gary St. Ledger, the twins, and Harry was coming in a lot. These guys are on the U.S. Olympic judo team. They're high-level jiu-jitsu practitioners. These guys, and I remember looking them up, and, and they were fighting for uh, the New York Athletic Club, which is a prestigious sports club in New York. And I just couldn't believe I was even in their presence. And I remember just this one time, Randy was a professional MMA fighter, but not a in the UFC just yet. And it was just me, him, and Harry training wrestling takedowns. And I was like, I can't believe I'm in the room with these guys. I just can't believe it. It's just me. I'm here by myself. And I really feel like those early days with Harry and Randy and you and Sensei like gave such a leg up to get that kind of technique one-on-one -on -one because now you go to class, there's always 20 something people and there's always 20 something guys. So, uh, yeah, I'm really, really grateful that Harry, um, you know, blessed us with, with all that early judo. And I picked up some things that still to this day, little foot sweeps off balance and Kazushi, just like all these things that we used to train. I'm, I'm so grateful for those lessons. Yeah. Him and his brother, they were amazing. They still are amazing. You know, Harry's coaching yeah. high level, uh, uh, mixed martial artists. Out, oh yeah, out west and his. You almost can't watch a UFC there. event without seeing him in the background. Like they don't talk about him, but if you look by the cage side, he's almost always there. I mean, it's amazing yep. how many guys he's coaching out there at Jackson Wink. And I'll, I'll never forget um, my first judo competition that, that Harry and Sensei brought me to, and it was my first experience watching high level judo and seeing him and his brother compete. And if you're familiar with uh, Travis Stevens. Uh, Olympic medalist was, was competing. I think he went against one of the St. Ledgers. Also a podcast a, guest. He's been on oh, the podcast. Yeah, great, Go yeah. back and listen to Travis Stevens. High level judo guy and um, works with Fuji, I believe now as yep. well, right? Yes. Um, and it was my first time realizing and seeing with my own eyes what Sensei and, 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 and Harry had spoken about when they talked about um, Jigoro Kano of the empty key and seeing how someone can just become almost weightless in air when it looks like it, everything's perfect, they're about to be thrown upon everything and they become lighter than air and float and land on their feet. And I'd never seen that in actuality before. It's hard to, you can talk about it, but you know, when these guys are really going at a hundred percent, it's a yes. whole different speed. And to see that with my own two eyes was, was, was enlightening for sure. It, it's, it's uh, it gives me chills when you say it because um, it's like, the, the aspect of what judo is and then the aspect of what jiu-jitsu is, like people who know nothing about fighting, nothing about martial arts would just say, well, why don't you just stand up or why don't you just push him away? Like, I'll just punch him, you know, and, you know, there are these all these arts. The art of judo is just so beautiful. Sensei instilled that in us. And um, and then the art of jiu-jitsu, of course. But maybe you could just tell us tell us a little bit about Sensei. Like, what is, what is it about this guy? <laughs> He's this incredible human. Yeah, you know, he's just, you know, anything um, anything good to do with martial arts, you know, he has embedded in him. I don't know if it's from birth or from when he first started training, but he's, you know, one of, or if not the truest martial artist I feel like I've ever met. And obviously, I guess I'm biased. You know, he's he's my sensei. Um, he's the only person I've ever trained jujitsu under. Um, uh, other than going to other people's classes, you know, since they sent us to Henzo's in the city to train under, under Professor John and things like that. But um, I've never trained anywhere else. I'm obviously business partners with him now as well. Um, so I'm biased, but um, yeah, probably the truest martial artist I've ever met in terms of not just technique, um, the way, you know, the way he goes about his life, you know, living a life of Budo, um, 
and his skill set is so varied. You know, you, you meet a lot of people who are very good martial artists in in one or a few domains. Um, but his it seems to be never ending, you know, whether it's weapons, whether it's judo, whether it's Muay Thai, whether it's jujitsu, um, high level MMA coaching guys like Randy Brown and, and back in the day, you know, Felipe Nova and other guys. Um, I think he just really lives it all, all the way through, you know, and I say this to my students sometimes. It just seems to be even Harry St. Ledger and, and Gary as well. Like there, there seems to be something different about martial artists who start very young and never stop as mm -hmm. opposed to um, myself, yourself, you know, we weren't old guys when we started, but there's a difference between starting in your, your mid to late twenties and starting when you're 13 or starting when you're eight and never stopping and uh, developing different skill sets from different types of arts and you know sensei was also lucky enough to find someone like sifu ralph mitchell very early in his life to become a mentor for him and then if you look at sifu ralph mitchell same thing about you know being that true martial artist living the life um in and out and, and his experiences uh in the early years of martial arts here in new york you know at war in vietnam and, and things like that that are also embedded in sensei now and then you know sensei's path has just crossed so many elite people ending up originally here in Valley Stream, down the block from where Budokan is now, at, at Rodrigo Gracie's, where he started, mm -hmm. who was also on the map there, Matt Serra, then eventually ending up at Henzo's, ending up in front of Professor John Danahar and, and, and having him make a huge impact in his life. So he, you know, he, he absorbs all these things from all these elite martial artists. And um, he, he's on top of all that, but take away everything he is as a martial artist practitioner, he has this extreme ability as a teacher that mm. not many people have. He's a very, very highly skilled teacher and can convey the arts to people in a, in a way that I haven't really seen many other people able to do. Um, and not just adults, the, you know, any age group, you know, you, mm. you, you, you check out our, our youth program. It's amazing what he does with these kids from start to finish. And then even go down to little samurais. He's still, which many black belts of his level won't, won't be teaching you wouldn't find them teaching a youth program, let alone a little samurai type program that are, are, you know, four to six years old or whatever, very beginner intro to martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, and what he does with these kids and, and the way uh, he can uh, help them to thrive in martial arts. And, and we do have people who started there and are now, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old or whatever the case is, or, or 17 years old and, and are still in it and are on their way to being that elite level martial artist you know it's really amazing yeah it is incredible and um not only is he an incredible martial artist but he's also an incredible artist and mm. and student he's extremely well read you know over the years he's brought up books and philosophy and our mat chats at the end of class and those have been some of the most influential talks in my life i've probably gotten as much out of the mat chats as i've gotten out of the training and I've talked about this a lot on my podcast, and it's a central aspect of the book that I'm about to finish, Business Jiu-Jitsu. But we'll be training. He'll be teaching some technique or some principle of some technique. And then he'll start talking about it through the lens of philosophy or uh, history. And I'll be sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'll have unwound some complicated business problem that I had been trying to solve all day at work, and I, the, it was eluding me. And then there I am at work. Then I, there I am sitting on the jujitsu match and sensei is talking about it. And I'm thinking to myself, is he in my head? Like, does he know what I'm dealing with at work? Why is this lesson so important to what I'm dealing with in these other parts of my life? But it's not just about work. Sensei taught me so much about uh, parenting from things he said over the years. I was 24 when I started jujitsu. His, basically his son was just, an infant when, when I started and it was at least 10 or 12 years before I had my first child after that. But I had heard him talking about parenting all that time. And I loved the one thing he always said is like, you know, teaching is like having an infant. They look at you. They look at the spaghetti. They pick up the spaghetti. They look back at you. They take that spaghetti and they throw that spaghetti on the floor. And he said, you have one of two options. You could say, no, why are you throwing the spaghetti on the floor and going crazy? Or you pick up the spaghetti, you clean the spaghetti, you put the spaghetti, you know, new spaghetti on the plate and you look at them and now you say, eat the spaghetti. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to pick that spaghetti up and throw because they're testing you. 
And so the amount of, and that's just one of countless lessons that he's taught me on parenting and business and life and philosophy and strategy. And I'm always so shocked because I'm still going to these classes, right? And I've risen to be one of the upper belts. And I'm like, he's still pulling out the gems. <laughs> he's still pulling out the gems after all these years. And then sometimes it's a story that I've heard dozens of times, dozens of dozens of times. And he'll add a new detail in. And I know the story so well, but he's, he's, he'll now add a new detail in. Or I'll hear it. I've, maybe I've heard it before, but I'm hearing it with fresh ears and fresh experiences in my own life. And so to have this kind of um, teacher-student relationship, whereas um, you, as he would say, you can accept the knowledge, it has just been so rewarding to me. And then, of course, I was... You know, I, I had begged him for a year. I said, like, you got to write a book. And I don't, not because I said that to him, but he wrote a book and I have read that book from cover to cover. You have no, I don't even know how many times, you know, I have just devoured that book over and over and the lessons over and over and over and over and over again. And um, I keep it right. You can't see it. It's off camera, but right in front of me, I have my dad's first book and I have sensei's book right there uh, to, to hear those lessons. And I just... Listen, I, we are biased. He's our sensei. But I will tell you the same thing I said about my dad when he wrote his book. I've read hundreds of books now. And there is a very clear connection between uh, the philosophy of Sensei Nardu and some of the best thinkers. And because he's been influenced by them, you know. And so like you, I just feel I feel extremely grateful to be a student of his. And, um, you know. That that is my only teacher. You know, I've I've learned all over the world from people, but I only have one sensei, and that's a pretty incredible thing, I think. Yeah, we're we're you know very fortunate to have walked into that original dojo, and, and like you said, even more so, I think the guys who still walk into the dojo today are very fortunate um, to to get to learn under sensei. But there's something special about being part of the beginning of something and, and, and having that, that, like you said, that one-on-one -on -one contact um, to absorb straight from the source and, and everything he brought to us, whether it was Sifu Ralph Mitchell and, and Harry St. Ledger and, and other instructors. Um, it's so vital. And, and like I said, we're fortunate to, to have walked into that because yeah. uh, a lot of people who don't have martial art experience, whoever they walk into, they're kind of in, in awe of, and they, they look at them as that um, elite teacher and elite martial artist. Because when you know nothing of something, someone who knows a little bit more than you can look like they're elite. Um, and, you know, now with all of my experience in this business as a martial artist and in other facets, um, not everyone is as fortunate as that, you know. And, yeah. and a lot of people are on their third, fourth, fifth instructor because, you know, they get to a certain point and they realize, oh, this guy, that or this or whatever. And there's a lot of great teachers out there. I've, I've met amazing people in this business. And um, New York is uh, packed. You know, it's, 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 it has more than its fair share of elite martial artists oh and elite God. teachers. But, you know, there are ones that, um, you know, their students won't preach their, their, uh, their positive uh, attributes like, like you are. And, and uh, I, 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 I was having this conversation with one of my best friends who just started jujitsu. Shout out, Gavin. And I said to him, you don't understand the tentacles off of this man, Henzo Gracie. Like he mm. plants himself in New York City. He starts teaching a ragtag peak bunch of guys above a methadone clinic. And he's got and he spawns UFC champions like Matt Serra and Ricardo Almeida, ADCC and John Donahars. And I said, the, the remarkable thing is that what people have said over the past decade and, and past is that. There's guys in New York, like Sensei Nardu, that you have never heard of, that are lawyers and bar owners, and they have been training alongside, and they are absolute killers, and world champions from around the world come, and they're like, who is this guy Shaheen that just kipping escaped me and leg locked me? <laughs> who are these guys? And I just find it incredible that you can't go five miles in New York without hitting an absolute legendary academy and it's just growing more and more and more you know you've got like henzo to john matt and then you got now the further out of long island you go then now you have like nick ronan and and jason Rao opening academy like young blood and you just and then you have 
Henzo and then Sensei and 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 then you go Ricardo Almeida and like so you have all these guys and it's just amazing what it's been spawned and I can't wait to see where it goes in the coming years because there's so many great academies. But um, I really want to get back to you for a minute. Uh, I, I think it's important to say, first of all, I am my business is by far the thing that speaks mo most loudly about me, not my jujitsu technique. I love jujitsu, competent at jujitsu, but I am not a master of jujitsu. Uh, Matt is a master of jiu-jitsu wouldn't say it himself but i will tell you he has trained i've seen him train alongside professional fighters he's stepped into the ring himself victoriously uh and i have never even had an advantage against you i mean we've trained a million times over the years and i don't even think i've ever put you in a position of any kind of danger i've thrown everything i had at you but a few weeks ago we were training together and it was just, it was like, a, for me, at least a magical training session. We hadn't trained in a while. And um, it was just like a moment of where I thought for the first time that I may for one second actually be able to pass your guard or get some type of even like into an advantage position, not even that I was going to submit you, just to get into like side control. And I used a technique that I had been drilling a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And you shut it down. And I asked you about that afterwards, and you didn't even know what I was talking about. But we got into a great conversation of which I wanted to bring up here and see if you had thoughts on it. And you said something that that's why it was turned into such a special training session for me. And you said, that's what I love about jujitsu. So you said it was the aspect of creativity. And I just I kind of wanted to call back to your musical nature. You know, what is it about this jujitsu that we do and the way that you do it of like, not just the technical aspect, but also the creative aspect that like makes it so exciting. Yeah, the, the you know, at the end of the day, all martial arts, you know, they, they're all art forms, you know, and, and any art form, uh, a big part of that is creativity, I think, you know, and my first uh, experience with, with that was learning and playing guitar, you know, in, in my teens. And I think what I was, was referencing to that day to you was, you know, in the beginning, it was all about technique and, and learning what to do with your hands and where to place them, how to do a chord, how to do a bar chord, uh, how to read music in the beginning I, I was getting into. And then as we developed and I had a little bit, a um, certain amount of tools in my toolbox, you know, as Sensei would say, um, for the guitar. And we started, you know, me and my teacher started um, uh, jamming or as you would call jujitsu, you know, flowing. Um, and using our own creative ability to make new music that wasn't on the page or was someone what didn't tell us to play these notes or whatever. And I fell in love with that, you know, and there's a good and a bad to that because you do need that, that technique and you do need that, um, structured learning uh, to a point too. But I think the next level of learning is that creativity and, and to take those tools that you have and use your own experiences, your own background, body type, whatever the case is, and that'll change over time. You know, my creativity now, what I do with jujitsu or playing guitar is totally different than when I was in my twenties. Part of that is, is experience. Part of that is your body ages and changes and, 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 and things like that. But the ability to explore in, in whatever art form you're, you're working in, you see doors and pathways and windows and gaps that you may have never seen. Um, if you just stay on a structured path, you know, in terms of your teacher says do A, B and C. Um, and then you start to realize like, what if I do B, E, D, does that work? And sometimes it doesn't. And you're like, oh, that's why. But then sometimes it opens up a door that you never knew was there and you go through that door and then there's various paths from there that you never would have explored, you know? And that's why I love, and I fell in love with years ago, meeting up with, with friends and, and, and people like yourself who, um, have a certain amount of tools in their toolbox so we can communicate and have that conversation of, jiu of jujitsu with each other. But from there have no structure and just, you know, free flow for whatever it is, whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, 40 minutes, whatever the case may be. And you start to see different things, you know, and that's, that's the beauty of jujitsu. I mean, you could, you could look up even just on Instagram, you look up any different account and you could find five different black belts or nowadays, you know, high level purple belts, doing the same move, an on bar, a heel hook, uh, whatever it is, a triangle. And they'll each have five different setups for it or five different ways to finalize it and finish it. Um, well, there'll be certain techniques that someone will do that I'll look at and I'll be like, wow, I never even considered doing it that way. Or I'll do something that someone would be like, 
what made you do it that way? I've never, no one ever taught it that way. I never thought of that before. And that's the beauty of it. Just, just like any art form, you know, whether you're looking at someone painting a picture, uh, writing beautiful music, whatever the case may be, photography, whatever it is, that built in experience. And, you know, we each have so much different threads that make us up as a human. And when you use that in terms of creativity, who knows what comes from it? Yeah. It's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful way of looking at it. And not only do you do it there, but you embody this across the rest of your career. Whereas some people would be scared to try even one thing, but I see you, you know, pursuing all of these different businesses. And one of the things that people ask me all the time about uh, running multiple businesses is how do you do it all? You know, and they, they, they want to know the secret. And that's why I always try to ask people to find out what their like what has motivated them um, to be able to do all of these things. You know, you're running a promotion. Maybe you could talk about it for a minute. Rise, uh, professional grappling organization here uh, in New York. Not easy to run a professional sports league in New York um, with all the regulations. But you're being a manager. You're running a gym you know, amongst many other uh, careers. And so I think that there's a measure of creativity and also a measure of just saying, I'm just going to do it. You know, that's it. like, I'm just going to do it. That's it. I'm, that's, there's no other, there's no other way, but I try to always extract a little bit of the juice. I think it was Zach Mancelani who said it on the podcast, but quoting Daniel Cormier possibly. And he said, he calls it the rub. Like when he's, he meets somebody who has something like if you're a runner or a weightlifter and you want something and you say, I want that to rub off on me. So you, they called it the rub. So oh, that's good. I'm, yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. Tell me just a little bit about Rise before we wrap up this convo. Yes. Well, shout out to Zach. Zach's a great guy and one of our, our uh, referees at Rise. So um, he, always appreciate him coming out and helping us out. He's a, a, a great instructor as well. He's got great students like Renee Swasa, who you just mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm sorry. So I may Rise have mentioned was, Renee offline just so for, uh, I think I, I talked about that before we started the podcast. So, Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. No, it's okay. Um, so yeah, you know, Rise is a, um, definitely a, a passion, uh, project. Uh, it's a business and it's a, it's a profitable, successful business, but it's a type of business where if I wasn't passionate about it, um, there are a lot of hurdles to get over, especially since uh, COVID in order to hold any jujitsu event in New York, let alone one the size and scale of, of Rise. Um, we do things a little differently than a, a lot of other promotions that are, are active in this area. Um, and initially that was the whole reasoning behind starting it back in 2017 was there was nothing like it in the area. You know, at that point there was really only uh, EBI and submission underground on the, on the West coast. And there was some great um, submission promotions on a smaller scale and gyms and things like that on the East coast, but nothing to this scale. Uh, so trying to bring that to New York for the, the community here, but also, you know, I, I just feel that to really take this sport, to the mainstream and to the heights that it can go. Um, it needs to be put on that same level of, of stage as other uh, big mainstream combat sports like MMA and, and like boxing. Um, so, you know, when you can combine something you're very passionate about with something that is uh, an obviously growing market and, and, and the interest in the sport is, is, growing day by day it feels like lately i mean there's mm -hmm. there's there seems to be more promotions than ever before currently um more athletes um something i have talked about for years now with, with people who who were unsure of the amount of interest in, in televising sports like this um you know every day there's another white belt in 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 a school somewhere in the country there's multiple in new york and around the country and every time a white belt takes a class, they know a little bit more about jujitsu and the education process is, is just multiplying every day. Um, mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, the kids who are starting young and, and staying with it. So the sport is, is already hitting a, a um, almost like an exponential growth phase. And I feel like the next five years is going to be even more of that. Um, sure. So 
again, going back to the hurdles here in New York, you know, I don't want to get into them specifically, but there's a lot of them. And um, without getting too into detail, you know, New York does need to get um, on the same page as the rest of the country in terms of, of sanctioning and, and what the legalities are of, of hosting uh, submission grappling or, or jujitsu events here in New York. Yep. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not going to hamper the growth and, you know, it's not going to, I don't believe hold our organization back or, or any of the other people who are very serious about, about furthering the sport. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, any business, there's going to be different types of hurdles and speed bumps. And, and sometimes it's brick walls. You got to figure out your way around or over or lower your head and try and run through them, you know, and you know, that's also, you know, like you'd mentioned the, the beauty of training martial arts in general, uh, but even, even jujitsu more specifically is, it gives you that mental fortitude. It builds that mental fortitude in you to get by obstacles and to figure out and strategize. And, you know, that plays heavily into running any business, but even more so, you know, specifically a business like Rise Invitational. Yeah. Well, I have it pulled up on my screen here for those who are watching, but for those who are listening, it's riseinvitational.com and you can go watch the latest event on Flow Grappling. Uh, my company, Mixology Clothing Company, and Business Jiu Jitsu were sponsors. Shout out to myself. And, yes. uh, and I'm very, very grateful and happy to, to sponsor you and, and all of your endeavors. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have this level of promotion in, you know, in our backyard. And you run an extremely professional event. Great um, broadcast, probably helps that you have a background in some of that. And uh, one of the things I always love about going to a Rise Invitational event uh, is that our whole Budokan community and family and team comes out to support you, whether it's in the crowd or working the whole event from your wife, Melissa, at the front door and uh, Conicelli running the, the tickets. And, and we got Phyllis and Calypso and, and Jacques and Michelle. And then we got, of course, Ryan Williams on the gong and Professor Akbar <laughs> on the timer. And then, of course, Sensei, from time to time, we'll, uh, we'll referee. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to cross the worlds over like that. And and I, and really, at the beginning of business jujitsu, that's what it was all about for me was bringing my two lives together, business and jujitsu, because jujitsu was my Clark Kent alter ego. Nobody in my personal life understood it at all. Um, they would constantly ask me if I was still doing that karate thing. <laughs> and so I, it occurred to me one day that I could probably use this jujitsu thing for more than just training on the mat. It's been so helpful for me. Um, and, and that's why I started this. And it's just great to have these conversations. And I'm really, really grateful that you came on today and shared so much. And you dropped some absolute gems, which I know that a lot of especially young people, but people of all ages will, will really get a lot from listening to you. Um, let me show everybody where they can find you. So uh, on Instagram, you are at Matt Cully, C-U-L-L-E-Y with an underscore. And um, at Budokan Martial Arts, at Rise Invitational, and also your content platform at New York Fighting. And of course, www.rise, R-I-S-E, invitational.com. Matt, I'm really, really grateful for your friendship and everything you've done for me over the years. And uh, I just want you to know that I've passed that on so many times. What you've done for me, you inspired me. I can't even tell you how many times I've done it for other people, just being aware and reached out to them when they needed a hand uh, across all different aspects of my life. So it's, uh, as sensei says, each one teach one. That's it. That makes me feel good. That was, uh, it was, it was worth it then. So Very it's great good. to have you back and I appreciate you having me on your show, man. It's been fun. Thanks, Matt. Talk to you soon. Take care.